I probably couldn't have thought, or we couldn't have thought, to sit here in, in Katowice and talk to Polish like-minded people who are interested in hacking uh, with maps, with data, and producing visualizations uh, just a couple of years ago. So it's clear that we are all sharing like a common uh, passion or interest. And so we would like to just to make that introduction today um, about our, like where our fascination with maps comes from. And hopefully, based on that, we will look a little bit of how maps are being created and uh, maybe some useful links and tools to give you like a really, really broad overall understanding of um, how these design processes and development processes around map making might look like and how you could use that within the project um, here in Katowice. So let's make a bold hypothesis. We are all fascinated by such a look. We all would like to see the Earth in one picture. The first uh, image of the blue marble, the Earth from really far away, almost at moon distance, um, was really transformed, I think, our picture of mankind um, and allowed us for the first time to see how tiny we are in this universe. And map making uh, for the purpose of uh, navigation in the first place was done exactly for that purpose. So we wanted to know our way around, we wanted to see how our Earth looks like and how we get from A to B and this was the initial thing. The things that we do today with data visualization, mapping data to maps, um, is like an extension to that. Like, first of all, we wanted to see um, what's our place in the universe. And even in 2008, or even now, it's more increased the situation in 2014, we have a situation like this, where we see almost the same kind of representation of the Earth, just made through data. There's just some music on it, I will turn that down a little bit. But what you see here is people collaboratively um, editing map data um, on a platform called uh, OpenStreetMap. And for the title of the, the, the little introduction today, um, Radical Cartography, uh, we just make that bold hypothesis that this is actually the radical step. So giving people the power or uh, a system to work together on a, on a collaborative map of the world that is freely accessible to anybody um, is truly radical if we look at the history of maps. And so what you see here is people really, in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the smallest case, walking around with a GPS sensor, walking some paths or, or streets, and uploading that to OpenStreetMap, to this joint database, um, and make it available for everybody else. And you see here, for instance, like in such, in one, uh, at one time, India, for instance, got uploaded. And this is also by municipalities and administrations joining in and giving their data um, away or contributing their data to this open pool of information. And this creates a so much more high-res map of the world than you see in any of the single map providers. If you, for instance, look up Baghdad in Google Maps, you will likely see a less detailed representation than on OpenStreetMap data, just because there's political issues involved. And that's the one, one main reason why this is so radical. Maps have always been a um, ideological representation of a per certain perspective onto the world. One of the first examples of a map is the Appsdorf um, map of the world, which is actually a religious depiction of the Christian worldview. So the whole map is um, represented as Jesus, and in the, in the center we find Jerusalem. And all of the other places that were known to men back then have been somehow arranged in that worldview. So a map is always a worldview. There is no neutral representation of a map. And this also means maps are um, uh, instruments of power, I would say. So, depending on what you show and what you hide, you have a certain power in doing so. And this is the radical step about it, because that power lies within certain institutions, certain political entities, and now it's given, been given to the people. And this movement is getting stronger and stronger to free every data and give it to the people. And so we see a shift of power. Here, this is an example from the, um, from the times of the Cold War where um, maps of East Berlin in the GDR, in the former one, 
uh, just omitted whatever is uh, behind the wall just because GDR citizens are not meant to have any interest in that. And there's another nice anecdote um, for which I still have to find the reference somehow. But um, the Soviet army during the Second World War has released false maps of the surroundings of Moscow. So just that the uh, German army uh, ends up in an area where there's no infrastructure as they thought. Like they, they, they painted, for instance, um, streets and trails where there were none. And so the German army, led by this false information, ended up in the mud, which was a significant factor in, in the whole turnaround of the war, luckily. So maps are an instrument of power. And now this power has been given to the, um, to the citizen or to, to every individual. Here you see like small dots, you see it most clearly here probably, um, which is basically one GPS data point somebody uploads from some map database or from self-gathered map data or ge geolocation data. And the question is what we, do we do with this power? We try similar to the navigational purpose, we try to make some sense of certain topics. And sometimes those certain topics can be made sense of in a locative context. So if we look at things on a map, some patterns might emerge. And one of the famous examples, I just uh, also briefly mention why this is not, um, why this is more a legend than a proper example or a true example. But one of the first times that has been done in order to um, formulate a hypothesis, I would say, is this uh, London cholera map, map by Dr. John Snow, which is um, during that time there was a cholera epidemic in, in, in London and um, there were two main hypotheses. First one is cholera was um, transmitted through air. The other one was cholera was transmitted through water. And researchers on both sides have been, done, have been doing excellent research in order to prove their point. And both sides have been doing that with really good and really well-made data visualizations, drawn by hands, statistics, observations, measurements. And this was basically from the water side, let's put it that way. So Jon Snow basically mapped deaths caused by cholera in London in a certain neighborhood and also plotted, you see little crosses, I hope, somewhere on those maps. Um, it's a bit small, I apologize. <coughs> and so uh, he plotted all the deaths around Wa um, uh, water wells. So wherever there's uh, access to, to drinking water, he uh, made a little cross. And through that, a certain pattern emerged. For instance, uh, this density around one water well, which led to this strengthening of the hypothesis that cholera has uh, been transmitted through water. The legend goes on that in that moment, everybody was suddenly convinced that cholera was transmitted through water which is not true, un uh, unfortunately, or, or maybe fortunately, it's, that's just real life. Certain key insights take just some time to be really evaluated and it's accepted by everybody in the research community. Still, it's a good legend. So with this at this moment, we see a pattern and suddenly it makes sense. And I'll just skip that historical part now because it's more focused on the hands-on approach here in this context. And so the question becomes, um, how, where do we, or how do we do this nowadays? How, what is the do Dr. John Snow's um, of today? Um, what, are they, what kind of technologies are they using? What kind of projects are they doing? Like how are they trying to understand things through maps or simply not understand, but also communicate if they have understood something or if they have a certain kind of data? And um, one project that I'd like to uh, show is because it, we can basically um, best answer all questions about how it's made, is um, a project that should illustrate one thing. Um, you can really quickly build such a project like this with the op all the open source tools. So the main point is here, the, all the tools that I'm going to show, um, we are standing on those shoulders of giants. So we have lots of lots of good tools that we can use for making such maps. And we basically put together these building blocks in design outputs and in, in, in prototypes to show a certain idea and to try to convince people to join in a certain initiative. And one of these examples from such a project is this Othello time map, which is from a project that we were involved in since 2011, where it is about analyzing and comparing and visualizing German translations of Othello, Shakespeare's Othello. So we have collected 37 German translations of Othello from um, 1766 till um, 2010. 
it's now a bit, even a bit more, but this was what we had back then. And we tried to find um, interesting variation-rich translations, which are the most exotic translations and which are more normal, whatever normal means in terms of translation and adaptation. And as part of that project, we also collected data on where was each play written, where was it being, has it been published, and, and, and so on. And so this information, we decided we want to take to, to put that on a map for people just to have like an entry into the project. Like, this is interesting, it's a map of German translations of Othello, um, let's find out more about it. That was basically the plan, which was worked out really nicely. And I just want to talk, don't want to talk too much in detail about the project, but interesting things to mention is, we have a map with um, a bit more complicated, let's say, visualizations on top of that map. So we have little histograms around uh, each of the cities that we have in the database, Dresden, Leipzig, here's Berlin with, of course, most of the activity. And these are um, sorted from left to right in like 50 year steps. So they are being grouped and it's so this is a little histogram, a little so-called binning of the data of the years that we did there. And if you hover over one of these items, the, the path is being revealed of this certain translation. So this is one translation, all three points, which means this has been written in uh, this has been written in Dresden in 1851, uh, rewritten in Oldenburg uh, in 1851, and published in Berlin by Reimer in 1851 as well. And th so this is how you can scroll or navigate all these translations in a locative context. And it would be interesting, we have the data now for the Czech translations and adaptations and performances, so we'll be planning to adding on adding that. And here you can even like read some of the ins uh, information put together by the researchers. And this took roughly three weeks time to build. And without any really solid experience, and uh, we could, you could even now be much more faster if you did it once. Um, and this is just to, ex to show you what can be done in what quick time. And um, I'll show a bit about like, what kind of components this is based on, like what is this built with uh, in the next steps. So first thing that it is built with, oh, I forgot to mention one really significant part, <laughs> of course. Because I just thought about it. Um, one interesting bit is of course that if you plan, uh, if you play with historical translations of Shakespeare, it doesn't make sense to show an actual political map, Germany and its boundaries. So what we did then, which took actually more time than building the goddamn map, is um, going for uh, on the search for historical map data. And this is harder to get to do than it sounds, because there was a really huge European um, historical map data project. And I, we, we got in contact with them, we tried to convince them or tried to f even find out where is that data and how can we get hold of it and are they willing to um, support the project. And bottom line was, uh, after talking with multiple partners from that post, uh, project which was 10 years old, that nobody has the data, <laughs> nobody knows how to get to the data. <laughs> and so public money was basically buried in some server and some hard drive. Which is one important thing why this power to the people is super important. You have to be responsible to, 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 to make sure this public money is spent in a way that um, collected data is being archived properly and made accessible to the public. And so what we could get hold of, which because it was in Harvard somewhere, in, um, was a selection of um, German historical maps in the 19th century. And so if you click on um, uh, translations from that period, um, an actual political map of the of the um, lordships or however you say that Herzog Tumor um, is being displayed. So you see the rough um, political order uh, during that time, and um, this goes on until I think the 1918. So with the end of the fo first war, this is the German Reich, um, sh um, five years before the First World War. So um, we try to show these boundaries in order to get some accurate historical context. And this is important, this is important. And that's what I wanted to tell before I say that Tymel was basically at the heart of producing the white map layer underneath. This is not a complicated design as you can see, it's really minimal because it should all be, focus should be uh, placed on the, on, the, on the visualization elements on top. But Tilemill by a um, really good company called um, Mapbox, which produce 
really great um, products on top of open source projects. So you can use, um, and there are also map geeks doing awesome map design. <laughs> I just have to use the word awesome here. Um, and so you can download Timel. It comes um, uh, with lots of data already on board, and you can start right away producing a map in like a couple of seconds, you have your first map. And you can import such historical data or any other data that you find on the web. Um, of course, there's uh, always the devil in the detail, but basically you can use all data sources that you find on the web. Uh, you can use that with Timel, and you can even publish your map from Timel to Mapbox. And then you have a link, you have a map online running, and you don't have to program uh, anything. This is not programming, don't be afraid of that. This is more or less a set of rules where you can say like, okay, um, the outline of this country should be red, the outline of that country should be blue, and so on. This is rather easy to learn, and um, whoever is interested in diving right into that, we can give some um, advices on how to start there. I was mentioning the data sources. Historical data obviously is a problem um, at some, for some projects. Um, a really good data source for general um, geographical and uh, topographical data is the Natural Earth data set, which is free uh, in multiple resolutions. Um, uh, lots of different data sources, bathymetry, which means uh, how the, uh, the, 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 the bottoms of the oceans um, are laid out. Um, uh, and, and all these kinds of political data sets and stuff. So you can b basically go to Natural Earth, the link is in here. You will get the link to the speaker deck PDF later on. I'll up upload it then so you can don't have to write out anything. Um, and so Natural Earth is one really great data set. And then it depends on the geographical context that you have. For instance, the U US is very really well covered in other data sources. For Germany and uh, I'm sure for Poland it's the same situation. There's also the, the state-run um, um, ministries or, or organizations, as you said, the GeoDZ um, even is named the same way. So these usually provide also usually open data sets in a really good quality that you can use right away with Timel in most cases. Oh, you have seen that. An animation, nice. I can't, I can't forward it, sorry. <laughs> um, and what is interesting to observe, without going over so many projects, what is interesting to observe, with these set of tools and available data, maps start to emerge as a sort of um, ob subject of, or object of exchange. People create thematic maps, such as this of, um, I have all preloaded them, so I don't need to click the links. Um, so people create maps based on available data, such as building ages in Portland, Oregon. Um, and they, they can create maps and this starts to inspire other people and they say like, oh, I want to do that map of Amsterdam. And now you have that whole map of all of the Netherlands. I want to do that map of Brooklyn, New York. There you have it. Um, because usually also the um, data sources here, for instance, Source Bureau of Technology Services um, is shared along with the map so you can download it, get tile mill, start yourself and follow that fascination. And here, for instance, um, you see color-coded outlines uh, or building footprints, and the color code is basically representing uh, the age when the building was set up. And this ranges from, and this is debatable, of course, the color scheme uh, in terms of readability, but this raised, um, ranges from 1899 um, or a bit earlier uh, until the 2010. But 1899 makes actually sense because Portland is not that old. And so you see, how the city from the bluish inner things expanded out to the suburbs that were probably built in the 50s and 60s in the, in the private housing booms in, uh, boom in the US. And additionally, also as in the Othello map, on top of that is a small visualization that shows just a graph of how many buildings were built in each year. And so you can see like when does a city explode. And this would be super interesting for Katowice as we've discussed already. Same as you can see, different color scheme. Also debatable how that works. I'll talk about the rainbow color scheme later on. Um, but the interesting bit is, that's interesting. I'll I, I have found the same data about a different city. I'll produce a map for it. And people exchange about it on Twitter. And the whole map thing becomes a sort of like a 
messaging or medium, I wouldn't say medium maybe, but it becomes an, ex uh, an object of exchange. And the second core part, which is not um, uh, part of Tilemill and Mapbox, is uh, D3 by Mike Bostock, which is one of the most powerful data, data visualization libraries that I know. And this is really well designed. And whoever is interested in building data visualizations on the web, um, in the browser, um, I highly recommend to, to learn that um, first. <laughs> or even start programming learning that, because there are, some, uh, there are some, co some concepts in there which really also make it easier once you have gotten above, uh, beyond the first small bump. But the D3, the other big advantage of D3 is there are so many examples and tutorials written by Mike himself, who I don't know when he sleeps, but... Um, <laughs> so there's an, a massive amount of learning material around D3, also some of the highlights around maps, which I'm going to mention. So um, just write that down. Um, and um, we are going to look how to create um, maps with D3 later on in the introduction. Um, but uh, b but I, first want to, I first wanted to mention that, so you know there's another component in the Othello map. And uh, there's another kind of data source that you can use while working with time mill. And this is sort of like the overview of geographical data. And the other part of that geographical data is uh, digital images. So geographical data is sort of, you have to imagine it as ve vector data. It's just dots connected uh, by lines, or even not connected by lines, but it's just individual dots. And you use those to draw outlines of countries, as in this map. There's a second data source, which you can use for beautiful um, terrain maps, um, where, you, where you are interested in how the landscape is, or the topo top topology um, um, looks like. And this is, uh, these are um, raster images, so like regular images you've, like you have from a digital camera. And you can use that in tile mill as well, as I want to show in that example, so you get an idea of what you can do in terms of like visually designing your map so it really looks not just unique, but effectively designed for the purpose you're designing it for. So because often pre-built maps have a certain level of complexity that is um, not good for any project and for the visual direction of any project. So this is a map that we've quickly built for, for a bigger German research network. Um, it's a, a migration path of a stork, of a white stork. So it started in, in Germany and go, went um, um, uh, next to the Alps and all the way down to Morocco. And uh, there we wanted to uh, find like a visualization that is um, applicable to the to certain kind of data that came from the tracking. And under, underneath the, or below that, um, underneath that should be a terrain map that is um, clearly shows the terrain, but doesn't get in the way of the, of the overlay visualization. And this is what you can do with time mill and digital elevation models. You have to imagine that like a big, big image, and every pixel in that image, the color tone of that image, represents the height of the Earth at that point. And so um, what you can do then is to use that information and draw other colors uh, um, over it. And so you, this is just like an ex, uh, extreme example of for us to understand how the topo uh, topology um, uh, works. And so you see, for instance, uh, parts below zero is this dark violet going to black kind of colors there in Italy. Also around Venice, this is also one of the problems Venice has when it comes to flooding. And the black spots um, in, the, in the Alps are um, mountains above three and a half thousand meters. And so you can use that information to create really custom looks. This was, of course, for us to understand the data, to understand how that image is, uh, maps um, the elevation. And then you can use this information to really use different color schemes. For instance, you can also shade the hills depending on how steep they are. So you can find the best skiing hills to, to, to go down. And you can also um, invert the whole um, topo topology map or the whole uh, terrain map uh, in order to work with lighter colors on top of your map, which is also something not, you can't, cannot do with um, pre-built maps. And this is the third data source, and you find those files that we used for this also on the Natural Earth website, so they have all, all of that. So this is all the, th the components that you need to fine-tune your maps. 
Now about the design. Um, usually we see lots of maps that show some data um, color coded by some color scheme. In the worst case, they range across all colors, which is called the rainbow color map, and we are pretty used to seeing that in the wild. And it's bad. Why is that bad? Because the, the rainbow color map has an inconsistent um, uh, transition of lightness in the colors using, used to encode data values. And you see that here, the cut in the middle of the uh, United States looks so extreme, but it's actually just minor differences in the data just because the um, light, yellow, uh, the light green is so much more lighter than the darker green right next to it, which actually relates to the, to the neighboring data values. So there is Color Brewer, which, if you don't know how to code, is a perfect tool for you to um, collect a certain number of well designed or well-defined colors to map the different data categories. So you can just define how many data categories do you have, and you can c copy those color codes, and you are sure that um, the lightness transition or the lightness um, relationships between the colors actually relate linearly to, to data. So Color Brewer is a tool you can use on, online. Link is in the PDF. The other thing is, Try and read Mastering multi hue Color Scales from, uh, by Gregor Eich, who is uh, now working at the New York Times. And he's probably, he deserves an honorary PhD for uh, color uh, uh, to, to, to push that idea forward that Moritz Schifana has once mentioned. And, um, and he wrote a really detailed blog post. So if you want to nerd out about color, he wrote a really detailed blog post uh, about um, lightness transitions uh, between in, in color scales and how to correct them and how to make them more readable and more adequate in terms of like how they display data. So read that as well if you're interested in that whole topic. He also has uh, produced a really good tool similar to Color Brewer where you can get your color scheme out and just uh, enter these colors. And this is um, how you can move forward in the visual design and of course this topic is uh, lots more complex. But the question remains for tools like Time Mill, what are the boundaries? What, can you, what, what, what is it you cannot do yet with Time Mill, for instance? And what are the boundaries? Doesn't mean you have to break them or you have to push them. It does first of all mean that you have to be aware of them and within uh, which boundaries do you move. And the biggest boundary for um, Time Mill at the moment is that they exactly like um, uh, Google Maps, for instance, or other online maps work with one projection, which is called Mercator. Or I don't know how you would translate it in or to pronounce it in English, but it's called Mercator proje projection, and this distorts the Earth in a given way, and we are used to it. It has its certain negative sides, but we usually do not get in contact with them on a daily basis, so that's why we it works for us. But it's important to highlight that uh, a, a map display is, again, coming from a certain cultural and locative background. So there is a reason why Europe is always in the center of modern maps, because Europe is the least distorted. However you put it, whatever kind of projection you use, Europe always gets away pri uh, quite nicely. And this is, of course, historically related. Um, and depending on what you want to show on the Earth, you have to make sure that you maybe um, think about which projection to use. Here, for instance, you have a, a specific uh, projection that tries to keep the um, area sizes between the countries most, equ most equally. Um, and uh, there, it's just put um, um, Australia in the center and put the south up. And these are, um, let's say, Australia-friendly maps, but because usually those is, this is the continent uh, alongside with uh, New Zealand and Japan, who often suffer the most from certain map, map projections. And um, so keep that in mind that a projection, there's t tons of ways of wrapping a sphere or an ellipsoid, which the Earth is, of wrapping that and, and putting that on a, on a 2D plane. Just keep that in mind that there are some issues and every there's not a perfect projection there are several projections which all serve a specific purpose and you have to know them and choose them um, to really uh, make your visualization or map shine and there's a nice little comic that i would like to reference here just read that and not not out about uh, map projections um, it's xkcd if you don't um, know that yet then you will really love it i'll just skip that here so keep in mind this is alaska 
there's different ways of how Alaska can look and don't torture your outlines, don't torture your countries, don't torture your continents. And the link to the really interesting article, choosing the right map projection is also um, below there. And this is what you can use only with D3, which I have been mentioning previously. So it's another reason to dive into D3 in order to free yourself from the constraints of the Mercator projection inside of uh, Tile Mill and other map frameworks. So Mike Bostock, who writes D3, but also writes um, tools to create um, optimized geographical data from certain data sources uh, called TurboJSON, from which this image is also has a beautiful and nicely done tutorial, let's make a map. Link is also there. And uh, do check that out for the comprehensive workflow of getting data somewhere on the internet and what kind of steps are needed to transform data sources from one into the other. And then use that with D3 and there you can go really crazy with I think by now 25 map projections to choose from. And you can animate them, you can transition them, Oops, usually it's more, um, more smooth. And you can set the center of where this projection should be centered. So if you want to put uh, Timbuktu in the center in Africa, then um, you're free to do that. And um, all the other things will be warped and morphed and transformed um, to match your projection and to give you a, a good representation. Is there something really crazy? Uh, there are some uh, some which are uh, really nice, but they are not in here. There's um, there are some map projections which have really which are actually cut out the earth or the the, the, the which peel off like an orange, the, which peel the earth off like an orange, and those are really interesting. You might want to check it out. The most famous of them is uh, the Dimension map by Buckminster Fuller, who has never heard that. Just write it down um, and look it up because the link is not in the PDF. So Buckminster Fuller and Map should give you the dimension map. And so to the last point, um, to finish that uh, introduction, is um, so you have all possible tools to do anything uh, with maps. Of course, some have their limitations and some have these other strengths, uh, but in principle you can go out and rule the world with what you have. You are standing on the shoulder of giants and um, you can go unlock data uh, and, and communicate through m geographic data and other data sources and go crazy about like how to use maps differently than they ha might have been used before and experiment with that. Make maps uh, al al alive again, make them become alive again. And one um, one challenge in that endeavor sometimes is the um, availability of historical map data, as I mentioned uh, earlier in the Othello project. And there are certain strategies that you can also think about in how to get the power of many people together in order to um, create digital data sources that help other people gain new insights, um, tell other stories or, or interesting stories. Um, and this is, um, you should also think about maps as a community data source that we can interact with and you can even design playful interactions that have a certain use um, in creating additional data, cleaning up data, uh, which is locked in, in old digital images and for instance one of the best examples I think, um, and I'm certainly not alone with that, um, is the New, uh, New York Public Library Building Inspector, which is a website that helps the New York Public li Library digitize historical maps of New York. And the problem they have is you have these digitized uh, maps and now you need to teach a computer, for instance, to recognize those shapes that could reform a building and that process is not 100% cl not clean and perfect, so that is maybe accurate to say 70 or 80% uh, if you are really lucky. And um, what they have built is a website and you can all can help and join in uh, doing that uh, which allows people to fix the results of the computer collaboratively. So you can make a game, I have fixed 25 buildings today, you can, uh, pin, you, you can, you can, you can point researchers or the, the New York Public Library people to um, errors in their data set and say like this building is not recognized properly and by, this, by using such a method 
they have increasingly sped up the digitization of their historical maps, which they, they are going to um, make available online for free. And so it's an incredible example of using that and not locking it inside ancient his, uh, institutions where people, single people control access to the data. And so think also about these playful approaches and how we interact with this, uh, with this data. And with this appeal, <laughs> I am at the end. Thanks.